Hey, welcome all back to our book club for the spatial R book. We are entering chapter 14, Proximity and Aerial Data, where we're going to consider the definition of aerial data, discuss matters of graph theory, and explore various methods of finding neighbors. Here are some of the packages that we will be using today, and we'll be mostly focused on this SPDEP package, spatial dependence. And our examples will be this data set about the Poland 2015 presidential election. So aerial units of observation are often used when simultaneous observations are aggregated with non-overlapping boundaries, particular emphasis on non-overlapping. Here we have an example of counties in Pennsylvania, or in other words, aerial data that we're used to is usually some uh, political subdivision of, of what we're looking at, such as uh, counties. This is the lung cancer standardized incidence rate of Pennsylvania, a correlation study to look at air pollution. The red values are higher numbers and the blue values are lower numbers. And it gives us a sense of where the lung cancer tends to be taking place in the state of Pennsylvania. As we know, aggregation like this takes whole areas and treats them with the same number, the same value. So there may be some issues thereof, knowing that in the state of Pennsylvania, there are cities, but mostly countryside as well. These images come from Paula Moraga's uh, book on geospatial data. Whereas for proximity data, we mean closeness in ways that make sense for data generation process that sought to be involved. In cross-sectional geostatistical analysis with point support, measured distance makes sense for typical data generation processes. For example, here, instead of using the, the previously described counties of Pennsylvania, here we have a Voronoi diagram this comes from a linguistic study by John Nirvan, where those dots were actually um, field researchers studying the dialects of the spoken language. So from those individual dots, the Voronoi diagram charts out places in the state that are closest to the, the dots, the field stations. In other words, in this one, we start out with the, the points and then we just des describe the regions afterwards by proximity. Flipping through again very quickly, the aerial data example were the counties and the proximity data example was the Voronoi diagram. From there, the textbook authors uh, defined a few more terms. I'll read this fairly quickly. By support of data, we mean the physical size, whether it might be like length, area, volume, associated with an individual observational unit. It is possible to represent the support of aerial data by a point, despite the fact that the data have polygonal support. When the intrinsic support of the data is represented as points, but the underlying process is between proximate observations rather than driven chiefly by distance. 
overall, when we're thinking about what constitutes neighbors, we'll talk about it a lot during this chapter. We have an intuition that data points that are close together are probably more valuable to each other than data points that are far apart in some sense. So it's kind of the reciprocal or inverse of distance. Distance, of course, are bigger numbers as we get far away. But when we talk about proximity, we want bigger numbers as we get closer. And the authors note that in general, we always assume the risk of misrepresenting the footprint of underlying spatial processes. For example, in the maps of Pennsylvania, these are generated one way or the other, but they might not um, acknowledge topographical features such as mountains or rivers. Or how the researchers define their test sites or their examination locations. So I'm thinking more broadly about representing proximity. There are some ideas going towards spatial autocorrelation, which is the next chapter of the book. From a graph theory mathematical point of view, we usually think of building an undirected graph. A directed graph can be used as well and its neighbors. From a geospatial point of view, the authors tend to think more about a variogram, the function that helps com compute correlation or yeah, that helps uh, represent correlations in the numerical calculations. But of course, we then have to take on the spatial matter as well. So the authors want us to think briefly about those approaches and consider, well, what happens if your study area has islands, literally physical isolated areas? In a mathematical sense, what if the graphs are disconnected? And then when studying large areas of land, a lot of them are, are sparse. You, you might have towns that are far apart from each other. And if you set some sort of distance threshold, you might accidentally remove some information. There might be some towns that um, are far apart, but might consider themselves neighbors. For example, for reasons of commerce and business, London and Paris might sound like they're far apart from each other, but are very well connected for the purposes of commerce. So with those ideas in mind, um, having to maybe encounter islands, et cetera, the authors developed the SPDEP package to handle spatial dependence. The objects created, as we'll see, include the NB type of class for neighbors. This includes a list of numbers for each node that has a number for how many neighbors it has in the undirected graph. In particular, we note that a node will have the number zero if it has no neighbors. As a superset, we then have the list of weights objects. It first contains the neighbors object, a list of numerical weights, and then a quick um, statement about how the weights were calculated. We also note that the SPDEP package used to have calculations, but functions for constructing and handling neighbor and spatial weight objects, tests for spatial correlation, and model fitting functions that used to be in SPDEP 
have been moved over to the spatial reg package, the spatial regression package. Thus, in other words, when we're doing the calculations here in this chapter, we needed both the SPDEP package and the spatial reg package. Okay, so let's see an example. We're going to look briefly at the poll in 2015 presidential election. This data set was in the uh, spatial data large package. For viewing purposes, we are going to briefly look at the territory the, uh, code name, the Polish name for the territory, and the data type. So as you can see, we have a multi-polygon with our usual sense of XY coordinates and bounding box and a projected coordinate reference system that's made for Poland. Here are the territory numbers in their data set, the territory names. And oh, I misspoke earlier, types talks about whether or not the region is considered to be urban, a, a city, area or rural, a countryside area, or perhaps a mix. Uh, thanks to our knowledge of tools such as TMAP, we could quickly get a visual. And this is the country of Poland that we're considering here. The urban areas are in yellow. The rural areas are in green. It's a quick side note, I've had a friend visit Poland recently. He said he loved how green the country is in terms of its numerous forest. The gray areas are classified as urban rural, which did surprise me that there's a lot of urban areas in, in, in this classification. And then finally, as, as you know, Warsaw is the capital of Poland, and we could clearly see where that borough is. Early on in our study of this book, we briefly talked about the notion of data validity. And the authors remind us to double check that before we proceed with calculations. So now what we're going to do is basically take the country of Poland, knowing that there are many villages and towns and cities, and try to describe who are neighbors. But there are multiple ways to do that. So going through the textbook sections, the first one was called contiguous neighbors. Namely, if the neighbors are right next to each other in some sense. There's a very convenient function called um, poly to NB, polygon to neighbors. And it checks um, how many points are within some distance of each other. If there are, if there's at least one point within like a threshold distance, we call that the queen distance, referring to chess. And if you want, a, a slightly more robust calculation for whatever reason, if there are at least two points within a distance of each other for the sake of finding neighbors, we call that a rook distance. In the R code, you can see that's setting the queen parameter to true or false, respectively. In the R code, we take the data set we're going to run our convenient function seeking out the queen's distance, and we'll call that version NBQ for queen's distance for now. Mm -hmm. 
this is a fairly sizable data set with about 2,500 regions, about 14,000 links. If you're studying this very deeply, you might have to worry about the percentage of weights. And in general, each node has about six links. Some more technical notes. The S2 spherical coordinates that we studied earlier are used by default. Uh, row names may be customized as if you are loading in files, like CSV files, like, like you know about elsewhere. And also symmetric relationships are assumed. The technical mathematical definition of symmetric is that if X is related to Y, Y is related to X. For another verbal example, if you agree that Austria is close to Italy, then Italy is close to Austria. That's the notion of symmetry. Moving forward, as I briefly mentioned before, we want to avoid situations where we have islands in the data, isolated graphs. So we will occasionally ask ourselves, are the data connected? That means as we draw some sort of graph on the country of Poland, could we get from any one village to another village using the graph? And we have to be concerned about this because the calculations algorithms that we might use later in the book um, would break if the graphs were not connected. So there's a very quick bit of code here that the authors use at times. And what it does is it counts how many subgraphs there are. You want the number one in this situation. And if you have more than one, that's when you know something's wrong. In case anybody's curious later, I, the authors also did things in a more verbose way, but I'll kind of hide that in the details. How are we doing, folks? Are there any uh, questions so far? Actually, uh, for the uh, the neighbor function, like uh, when you go scroll down a little bit, uh, yeah, that uh, that one. In this case, like a poly NB kind of functions. In that case, there might be. You also mentioned about the there might be the kind of. Uh, Polygon does not connect it. None of none of other other polygons. In that case, actually, this one gives an error. So, but to avoid uh, the uh, those kind of errors, you can actually have uh, another argument called the zero policy, zero dot policy equal true. If you add in these function, these arguments in the poly NB or list list W kind of functions, that actually allows to calculating the these things with the consideration of the polygon with the no neighbors. So this one is actually sometimes very useful when you think maybe whenever every time you run the function these kind of things maybe if you have uh, errors there might be the possibility to possibility that you have a polygon with no neighbor that could not connect it to other polygon in that case you can thinking about the calculating the your neighbor or links kind of functions by using the zero policy equal true. 
Actually, default is the false. But the thing is that sometimes you can use this one as a true and then uh, that actually allows you to the calculating that one. And then uh, even that case, you can actually calculating the other additional special regression model after that. So because the zero policy tool is actually allows you, allows us to calculating all of the, these kind of weight matrices with the consideration of the no neighborhood kind of situation. So that's the thing that I wanted to add. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to another textbook section called graph-based neighbors. The simplest form, um, mathematically at least, is triangulation, and that's going to be used using the Del Deer package. As we've seen before, when we talk about areas, we might have point representation using centroids. And here we have our, some of our code from the SF package to get the coordinates of the centroids. From the Del Deer package, there is a helper function that makes the triangulation and helps com compute the neighbors thereof. So once again, about 2,500 nodes, about 15,000 links this time, and slightly more dense as far as the number of edges in the graph is concerned. A nice um, corollary calculation is we could then ask ourselves, how far away are the neighbors? If we take the triangulation results, compute the distances, which I could always, I'm already worried that depending on your data set might be quite a long calculation time-wise. These results are in meters. So we could see that as of right now, some of the nodes are about 300 kilometers from each other. So we ask ourselves, should that situation where two towns are 300 kilometers from each other, should they be considered to be neighbors? Thus, there is a further calculation that you might find helpful called a sphere of influence. It takes the triangulated neighbors and removes or prunes off relationships where the edges are unusually long, where you have the lines in the graph that are essentially outliers because they're too long. So we'll run the triangulation through the through a calculation that computes these spheres of influence to try to keep nodes close together in some sense. And we'll retain that information here. Same number of nodes. It's probably annoying if I keep scrolling up and down, but smaller number of links because some of them have been removed. And the average number went down as well. If you're following along, um, yeah, admittedly, that was a lot of words and code. Perhaps pictures would be easier. So here's the Paulden uh, spatial data that we're looking at. Here's the triangulation. Let me zoom in a bit. Here's the triangulation. You can see, especially around the, the sides of the country, on the far north, on the southwest, and the east, you can see what we mean by the lines got pretty long to try to connect the notion of neighbors, but perhaps we do not want that. And also, once again, knowing that Warsaw is the capital of Poland, you could kind of get a sense of where Warsaw is. Thus, 
what Spear of Influence does is it looks at a network graph like this and removes the outliers. So once we apply the Spear of Influence, now we have this sense of where the neighboring nodes are. As you can see here, so when when we actually consider that these kind of inferences, you can actually find that that is the more maybe I think that this might be the dots, I guess. These little dots in here. So these are the kind of area has no neighbors. Not this one, because this one actually at least seems to have a little bit line in here, but the things that these kind of area actually no neighbors, so that means Actually, when we try to calculate the that's uh, geographically weighted matrices, like by using the least w function, that does not that some that generates some error message, which means that we have a zero neighbor kind of things. So in that case, I as I can say, zero policy dot true, gonna be the cake allows us to the calculating all of the these kind of network things, or with the consideration of the these to uh, these zero neighbors. Awesome, uh, thank you for pointing that out. So then one more broad approach to finding neighbors is the distance-based approach. We're gonna be briefly using the dear, dear, nay, Function. This has a distance band with a lower bound and an upper bound. For folks coming from machine learning, we quickly think of k nearest neighbors, that algorithm. And the SPDEP package has another helper function, kn to nb along the way. These calculations are already pretty complex. So the authors note that they take advantage of computational speed boosts using the DB scan package. And let me go back to the libraries real quick. The DB scan package is for density based clustering. So we're combining some previously established machine learning algorithms and helper functions to the spatial data. We could look at the NB disk functions again, uh, the distance between the nodes. Let me zoom out a bit. If we apply k nearest neighbors with one neighbor at a time for now, just to see how this works, the underlying graph would have these distances in meters. And we already have a situation where instead of some nodes being 300 kilometers apart, they are at most 18 kilometers apart. And thus, for the sake of thinking about what neighbors are, this seems to be doing pretty well. We find that the largest of uh, nearest neighbor distance is, is about 18 kilometers. So that gives us a threshold. If we use the distance nearest neighbors, we could just stop at 18,000 meters and save that as this um, data here. Now, as you've been mentioning, we probably should worry about situations that have no neighbors. So what I did was I formed a separate graph at, at a, a smaller distance just to intentionally have a situation where we had some isolated no neighbors cases. So in other words, this graph should not work in the calculations 
this graph should work. However, the authors noted that when they did double check for the node neighbors, they still found that there was some isolation there. So they went ahead and in an ad hoc way added on 300 meters just to make sure that what they got in the end was just one connected graph. With k nearest neighbors, you realize that you could also increase the number of of k to constitute like does a load have neighbors, and that will usually ensure at some point that you would have a connected graph as well. Depending on your application, uh, you might want an asymmetrical um, directed graph or a sim uh, symmetrical undirected graph. And there's a parameter for that. So whichever way we go with that, look at the left-hand side there, whichever way we go is that graph-based neighbors, distance-based neighbors, or contiguous neighbors, Recall that then on on the on the graph, the nodes and edges, we might have weights of on on the edges, depending on whatever calculation you might want to do. So we gotta create that list of weights object. As you mentioned, there is a zero policy argument, and by default, that's false. We kind of see that elsewhere in the R programming community, that sometimes the community decides to set a default value that might actually run into errors more often, and the holistic point of view is to force the analyst to double check their data and double check their, their algorithm to make sure that they are the ones doing things correctly. We will be doing some, some calculations. Lowercase n, like usual, will be the number of observations. And s naught will be the sum of the weights. If we go from neighbors to list with this helper function here, the capital B binary style gives a weight of unity to each neighbor relationship and adds up the weights with no boundaries on the edge of the study area. I said a lot of words there, but for now, we have still the original number of nodes. And here are the sum of the weights in this calculation. Like elsewhere in statistics, you might want to standardize the calculations, and that's what this W version of the parameter does. It adds up the weights around the edge of the study area that might have fewer neighbors. This gives a weight of unity to each neighbor relationship and divides these weights per unit by sums of the weights. Now you recall mathematically, whenever you do some sort of fraction or division, you have to worry about dividing by zero. At the beginning of the, where was that? At the beginning, we said that if there are no neighbor situations, the list has zeros in it. But if we're worried about divided by zero, that means we have to get rid of the no neighbor situations. So this is one of those situations where before you run the calculation, you want to get rid of the no neighbors. You want to get rid of the isolation and ensure that you have a connected graph.
this time around. Here we have the number of nodes. And because it's standardized, the, num the sum of the weights happens to be the same number. There are probably many applications where you would want to inver use an inverse distance. Because if you talk about neighbors, if you talk about proximity, once again, distance numbers get bigger as you go far away. But when you talk about proximity, you're trying to do the opposite. You want to give more weight to something that's close by. One way to do that is with a vectorized calculation of the reciprocal and, and getting kilometers here. And we'll save that as the weights of G, GWTS, graph weights. The authors note at this point, the no neighbor handling is handled by default. Um, again, making sure the analyst has to take um, a stance or position on how to proceed. But in other words, there is a way to apply the inverse weights to give more priority to neighbors that are truly close to each other. So thus, like you mentioned, we could make use of the zero policy argument, set that equal to true along the way to avoid the no neighbor um, nodes and to ensure that we do have a connected graph. You see at the top was our original number of observations. And as you recommended, when you point out the no neighbor areas, if we remove those, we have a smaller number of observations. There is one more section of the textbook, but I do want to pause here. Um, how are we doing, folks? Are, are there more questions or comments? Not really. Actually, good, because, uh, but the one thing that I want to add is uh, just kind of, maybe, for example, like uh, we have uh, A, B, C, D kind of polygon, and then, uh, our weighted matrix look like uh, kind of like uh, okay in case of the a a uh, maybe a actually have a neighbor with the b and b and d and then a b actually neighbors as a a and uh and d this kind of like a set of the kind of a uh, setting can be possible and then and then this one is actually kind of what is called the binary kind of matrices. And then what the W matrix actually done is that we actually calculating the total, total neighbor, total connection, maybe in this case two, and then we actually dividing by zero, divide, uh, zero divide, divided zero, uh, dividing zero by two, which is actually gives us a zero, and then in this case, it's a 0 0.5, 0 0.5, like a more like a standardized kind of approaches by based on the, this kind of a number of connection by the row total or maybe column total kind of things. That's the B and W option matrix is uh, different. And then, Uh, and then the other thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, maybe can you move a little bit close, scroll a little bit up? Because, uh, yeah, this one. Because uh, in case of the inverse distance weight, I think that uh, rather than the manually calculation like this, maybe I think that there is uh, options, there is actually R functions that allows us to uh to calculating the this inverse distance weight function i guess 
I think they, that is the IDW function, I guess. I, I'm not sure because uh, they definitely have a functions because whenever we uh, we have uh, those kind, we have a polygon and then uh, some of the geographic weighted matrices, there is a one one simple function that allows us to the calculating the inverse distance weight. So whenever we have a kind of a MB dist, dist matrix, like uh, usually, actually, usually when we calculate the distances like these kind of situations, MBD, what MBD does actually based on the Euclidean, Euclidean straight line distances between the centroid of the polygon. That's the how distance is the defined for the MBD. But, but in that case, maybe I think that if once we can calculate in the MB distance matrices, there might be the one, there might be the a one function that allows us to the automatically calculating the this kind of inverse distance weight function. I'm not, I cannot remember which function is. I'm not, I cannot remember exact name of the function that allows us to do that, but. In here, it actually tried to do the kind of seems like uh, doing the some of the by setting up the this kind of a uh, weight function and then uh, uh define after that we actually calculate the inverse distance ratio. But I think that there is a one function that automatically do these things. But yes, the things I, I can yeah. Yes, I completely agree with you. The IDW uh, function also comes up in text analysis, uh, semantical analysis for the same reasons where you want the inverses to talk, to have bigger numbers for things that you want to be considered close together. So yes, um, it is definitely IDW. And I also want to thank you for um, describing what the B and W matrices are I realized that the authors chose this language to perhaps avoid the math textbook description that the B matrix is the adjacency matrix. And then the W matrix is the row stochastic version of the adjacency matrix. So th this was definitely a different way of saying it. Yeah, because it's, oh, it's, it's a kind of a matter of how we can standardize the, those kind of a neighboring kind of a effect. Because uh, one major objective, I, I, as far as I know, one of major objective of the special data analysis is to remove the neighboring effect. Because uh, to remove the neighboring effect actually can be done by the setting setting up the, these kind of a weight matrices. And then by, by using the, these geographically, geographically uh, weight matrices, we can remove the, all of the neighbor, neighboring effect first. And then we, after the filtering out the, those neighboring effects, we can learn the normal kind of a regression model. And then that's the how this one is about. And the weight specification is that that's kind of important because uh, depending on the what kind of a bind, what kind of a weighted weighted matrix style we're gonna use, our special data regression result afterwards gonna be the very different because uh, simply binary is the zero zero or one function actually tends to be a little bit overestimate about the coefficient. But there is also still function that allows us to standardize those coefficients outcome. But the thing is, we some we actually uh, prefer to use the W options compared to the B options. But because the W option literally standardize of the uh, of the weighted based on the connections of the that specific polygon to the other polygons. Because uh, that standardization actually allows us to get the more standardized coefficient outcome when we learn the special regression afterwards. Maybe we can 
we can discuss this one maybe later, I guess. Okay, thank you for the insight. Let's go ahead and just briefly look at the last section of the chapter. Higher order neighbors um, said in math terms real quick, if we wish to create an object of uh, showing to neighbors where I is neighbor J, J is a neighbor K, then taking two steps on the neighbor graph would say that I is a neighbor K. The underlying calculations can be done with a lag function, NB lag. And the authors note that it removes the reflexive self neighbors. So um, in examples, uh, let's say if you take the country of Germany and you say that M Munich is a neighbor of Frankfurt, Frankfurt is a neighbor of Rotterdam, then two steps away would mean that Munich is a neighbor of Rotterdam. That's the idea. If you go along the graph and want to move multiple steps, we can consider that as well. I briefly flashed on screen that there are ways to, instead of having the neighbor objects, you could have a graph object. And the nice thing is, if you bring technologies for handling graphs, such as the iGraph package, here we ask ourselves, how many steps might be needed to traverse the entire graph? Like how far away can we be in that sense? And the diameter of the graph, the, the largest distance in number of steps is 52. If we did the graph approach, um, as you hinted at earlier, remember we we're dealing with n by n matrices. So sometimes these algorithms get um, computationally complex. Of finding the finding the maximum distance by number of steps would should yield the same answer. Along this diameter, finding like towns with the farthest distance from somewhere else in Poland, the municipality with that maximum count is, I'm going to mispronounce this, Lutowiska. And it's located in the southeast by the Ukrainian border. That is, you take that maximum number of steps plug it back into the original data frame to figure out which row it was. And we can find out where that, that path starts. And one more picture, um, that village of Lutowiska is in the Southeast. So it's in the yellow region at the very bottom of the screen. And what we mean by the diameter is that What we mean by the diameter is the maximum distance across that we could possibly take. But in the but in the graph sets. So the maximum distance that we could traverse this graph turns out to be from the southeast to the northwest, and that can be done in 52 steps. And that's the end of my presentation. Um, any more comments, folks? Actually, when we thinking about the higher order of the neighbors it is as far as I remember it is it is about the kind of a first order or maybe second order third order etc kind of thing so when we think about okay when we have a assuming that when we have a deep kind of a polygon once okay 
and then we only have a kind of a look kind of a neighbor. So in that case, when we say about the first order, maybe if we want to looking at the neighbor for the at the center of the polygon, it's a look one. This one, this one, this one, and this one gonna be the first order of the neighborhood. So that means it directly uh, adjacent to the that center polygon, right? And then that is actually, this one is actually first order. So when we have a second order, means, okay, now we have a much bigger kind of things, maybe, hold on, like, uh, and then, Like this, and then when we try to looking at the neighbor of the this one, so we can actually have this, 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 right? That is the first order, and then the second order gonna be this, 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 this. That's the kind of a ordering of the neighbor as far as I understand. So. Maybe when you have a queen's one, maybe entire these things gonna be the maybe second order kind of thing. So that's the how we can understand about the song. So the reason why it says about the I is the neighbor of the J and J is the neighbor with the K and then I gonna be the neighbor of the K means these kind of logics. Cause uh, based on the this one, this one is, this one is actually neighbor was this one, and this one actually neighbor of the this one. That case, this one can be neighbor of the this one based on the second order kind of algorithm. So that's the, as far as I know, maybe just kind of more visually, we, when we thinking about the ordering high order neighbors, we can understand like this way. It it also depending on about the how what kind of a neighboring definitions we gonna use. In case of the look one, we can actually have a, this kind of a ordering. But in the queen ones, maybe we can actually entire this entire gonna be the neighbor. So that means all of the, this polygon gonna be the second order gonna of the neighbor. In case of the queens, so I think that's it. Awesome. Thank you for um, filling in those gaps there. Because I think that there is a, some of the images that illustrate the same way that I just the drawing, but when I Googled it, I could not find it, that diagram. But as far as I remember, these are the kind of uh, how we can uh, looking at the old, higher order of the neighbors. So, just the first order is just directly related adjacent to the polygon. And then after that, the second order means that based on the, these adjacent neighbors, we can actually set up the, another kind of a layers can be defined as the neighbor of the, that original uh, polygons. So that's the, how we can define the order, higher order of the neighbor. Maybe third or fourth order can be defined, but but usually in the in the geospatial analysis, we sometimes think about the second order, but mostly first order will be kind of okay. But depending on the depending on the connection of our neighbors, we sometimes using the second order. As you can say, is that there is a, some of the island kind of situation which is the isolate from the old, isolate from the other polygon. In that case, we can sometimes thinking about the higher order neighbors to include those isolated island. When we actually thinking about the, this kind of a, uh, uh, adjacent type of the neighboring weighted matrices. But as you can say, maybe if we have uh, those kind of a situation, like an island kind of a situation, Maybe distance-based neighborhood neighborhood weighted metrics gonna be much reasonable. 
compare to the these kind of adjacent kind of a neighboring matrix uh matrices because uh, that distance based neighbor is gonna be the more like a standardized approaches to to get the get the coefficients of the spatial or correlation relationship in the spatial regression model. So I think that's it. Yep. And as you said, um these ideas will lead us into spatial autocorrelation, which will be in chapter 15. <laughs>